True believers in Jesus Christ will obey him. They will keep his commandments. They will obey God's word. How do we know this? Because that's what the Bible teaches. We're looking at 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 6 today that talks about this. Um, we've been talking about 1 John. We're going through it chapter by chapter. I put out chapter 1 on Tuesday, so if you have not seen that, I highly encourage you to go back and watch that first before watching this video. I will link it below in the description. And then yesterday, I actually put out this same study, 1 John 2, 1 through 6, on our Patreon page. So if you're not a member of our Patreon and you want to get this content and uh, unique content to Patreon um, a little bit earlier, you can go over and sign up there and do that. Now, you can support Glasshouse TV monthly on Patreon financially if you would like, or you can just sign up for free. It doesn't cost you anything, and the content is available to everyone, no matter if you support us financially or not. But I did want to make you aware of that that I am putting out content over there and that it is unique to Patreon. So we're doing the same scriptures today, but I'm taking a little bit of a different take on it in today's study. As I was uh, going over going over it this morning, the Lord just started laying some more stuff on my heart. So that's what we're going to talk about today in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. But let's go back to 1 John 1, 8 through 10. Because this leads into chapter 2. So he says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, in the, the video I did on Tuesday uh, where we went through this entire chapter, I go into a whole lot more detail about this, but I want you to pay attention to how John includes himself in the verbiage here. He doesn't say, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you, right? Or if you say you you have not sinned, or if you confess your sins, John is including himself in this. And obviously, John is a Christian, and John understands that even as Christians, we will sin again at some point. Now, I made the point in 1 John chapter 3 that we're abandoning the lifestyle of habitual sin. He's not talking about a lifestyle of sin, he's talking about an instance of sin. And these are very, very different. And by John saying this, uh, by acknowledging that we will sin again at some point as Christians does not mean that we're saying it's okay to sin and that we're advocating for sin and saying, oh, don't worry about it and treating it nonchalantly and as if it's not a big deal or even celebrating it or even accepting it and welcoming it and saying or embracing it and saying, this is just who I am and how it's going to be. Okay. That's not what we're saying at all. So to recognize the reason reality of it and the seriousness of it is not to accept it, okay? And we talked about that more in the last video, but John goes on to say, if we have not sinned, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And he continues into chapter two, where we will pick up for today. He says, my little children. So he's talking to Christians. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, this is so powerful. What is the point of this letter? So that you may not sin. John is not encouraging sin. He's not embracing sin. He's not making light of sin. But he's writing these things to us so that we will not sin. But understanding the reality of this fallen nature, he says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So we understand that sinless perfection isn't possible in this life. Total sanctification is the goal that we're striving towards. And I shared some scripture from Paul in the last video. We're striving towards this goal to please the Lord in all that we say and do. But when we do fail, when we do miss the mark, when we do sin, when we do fall, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. What is an advocate? This is seen as like a lawyer, somebody defending you in court, okay? So if we look at the Greek here, it's this word right here, 
Parakletos, where we get the word paraclete, might sound familiar to you. Uh, one who pleads another's cause before a judge, a pleader, counsel for defense, legal assistant, an advocate. So we've seen this before, right? Jesus Christ, our advocate. So he's using this legal sense or this legal term. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. This is so important and powerful to understand. And I was reading the commentary on this this morning by David Guzik, and he paints this amazing picture that I want to read to you, and I'll put it up on the screen as I read it. He says, It is as if we stand as the accused in the heavenly court before our righteous judge, God the Father. Our advocate, Jesus, stands up to answer the charges. He is completely guilty, your honor. In fact, he has even done worse than what he is accused of and now makes full and complete confession before you. The gavel slams and the judge asks, What should his sentence be? Our advocate answers, His sentence shall be death. He deserves the full wrath of this righteous court. All along, our accuser Satan is having great fun at all of this. We are guilty. We admit our guilt and we see our punishment. But then our advocate asks to approach the bench. As he draws close to the judge, he simply says, Dad, this one belongs to me. I paid his price. I took the wrath and punishment from this court that he deserves. The gavel sounds again. The judge cries out, guilty is charged, penalty satisfied. Our accuser starts going crazy. Aren't you even going to put him on probation? No, the judge shouts. The penalty has been completely paid by my son. There is nothing to put him on probation for. Then the judge turns to our advocate and says, son, You said this one belongs to you. I release him into your care. Case closed. Man. I read that this morning, and this is what's been happening. As I read this, and I'm reminded of the grace of God. This is what Jesus did for us, guys. We are guilty. We are all guilty. The moment we were born, we were born into sin. This is the gospel message. There is nothing we can do to earn that place. We are guilty. Ephesians says that we are dead in our trespasses. It's by God's grace that we are here. It's by God's grace that we are forgiven. It's by God's grace that we have salvation. I want to read you this. A human defense lawyer argues for the innocence of his client, but our advocate, Jesus Christ, admits our guilt and then enters his plea on our behalf as the one who has made an atoning sacrifice for our sinful guilt. So a lawyer will defend you saying, you're not guilty, you're not guilty. But no, what Jesus does, he says, no, you are guilty, but I paid the price. Heaven demands perfection, which you cannot offer. I cannot offer. But Jesus says, but I can. And he steps in in our place. Hallelujah. There is nothing we can do to earn it. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Guys, this is the gospel message. This is what Jesus has done. Verse 2 says, He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Now, what is this word, this big word here, propitiation, which is kind of tough to say? But let me read you this again from the commentary. It says, Propitiation has the idea of presenting a gift to the gods. So, as to turn away the displeasure of the gods, talking about the pagan gods back in the day. The Greeks thought of this in the sense of a man essentially bribing the gods into doing favors for man. But in the Christian idea of propitiation, God himself presents himself in Jesus Christ as that which will turn away his righteous wrath against our sin. So, the word implies that Christ has, as our sin offering, reconciled God and us by nothing else but by his voluntary death as a sacrifice, has by this averted God's wrath from 
us. So I want to read one line from that again. God himself presents himself in Jesus Christ. So the idea of propitiation is what they would do, the Greeks, is they would bring this offering to the gods and say, hey, have mercy on us, please don't do this. You know, or maybe we need some rain, or maybe, you know, uh, we want to have children, or maybe uh, whatever it is, we need wealth, or we need health, or whatever it is. It was this idea of bringing the sacrifice, but it was more of a bribing. It's like trying to pay them off to gain their favor. You had to do something in order to gain the favor of the God. But in the Christian faith, we know that we cannot do anything to earn God's favor. In fact, it says that God himself had to present himself in Jesus Christ. So it takes God to please God. You've heard me say that before. It actually takes God to love God. We learned that in 1 John chapter 4 when we're going to get there. It says that we love because he loved us first. So we can't actually love God back without God giving us his love to give back to him. Does that make sense? It takes God to obey God. We've talked about this in the past. In Ezekiel chapter 36, he says, So I will put my spirit within them, and I will cause them to obey my statutes and my rules, talking about the new covenant. And now we have the Holy Spirit within us, which allows us to obey, which allows us to keep God's commandments, which we can choose to walk in the spirit and avoid sin. So it takes God to obey God. We cannot obey God apart from his spirit or devoid of his spirit. It takes God to satisfy God. When you start to look at this, because Jesus Christ, remember, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. So it takes the perfect righteousness, Lamb of God, the perfection of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. It takes God to satisfy God. It takes God to satisfy your debt. It takes God to satisfy my debt. We cannot satisfy it on our own, so Jesus had to come and do it on our behalf. This is what it means to believe in the gospel, to to believe that what Jesus did, that he came and died, and that he was in the grave, and that he rose again on the third day. This is what we're believing in, that we cannot earn the favor of God in our own works, by our own hands, and so many of us are doing this. And I've done this my whole life where I try to earn God's favor. If I read more, if I pray more, if I give to the poor, if I do this, and we try to earn God's favor, not understanding that we were dead in our trespasses. And it's only by believing in what Jesus did that we can be saved and that we can receive his grace and that his spirit will come dwell in us. It takes God to satisfy God. If you haven't noticed, it's all about him. Everything comes back to him. He wants to know you. He wants to know me. He wants us to choose him back. He wants to reveal himself to us. He wants us to know him, but he wants to know us as well. And he wants us to choose him. So he gave himself so that you will know him and that he can know you and that we can be in right relation. It's all about him. It's all about Him. We live our life for Him, not for ourselves. Everything comes back to Jesus. Everything centers around Him. It takes God to satisfy God. It's all about Him. And the other part of this verse says, and it's not just for ours only, but also for the sins of the entire world. He made the atonement for the entire world, but atonement does not equal forgiveness. So the entire world is not automatically forgiven just because Jesus died for the whole world. They have to believe this gospel. They have to believe this message. They have to receive it. They have to understand 1 John 1, 8 through 10, that everyone sins, that we're a sinner in need of a Savior. And then once they believe on the name of Jesus, once they believe that he came, he died, and he rose again and have faith in that and put their trust in that, then they will be forgiven of their sins. We have to understand truly the condition of our heart, right? We have to understand that we are dead in our trespasses. 
So we understand after John says this, I write that you may not sin, but if anyone does, we have an advocate. And I just explained what that meant. He's the propitiation for our sins. God sent himself to satisfy himself on our behalf because we could not do it. And not just for us, the ones who believe, but it's available to everyone who would believe. So let's move on. Let's look at these last four scriptures. And by this, we know that we have come to know him. This is the fruit of truly believing what we're about to get in right here. This is the fruit of truly believing. And by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk the same way in which he walked. Who's he talking about? Jesus. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which Jesus walked. So when we look at this and we read this now, after explaining these first two scriptures here, do you see this as if you want to become a Christian, you have to keep the commandments of God? No. We see that we cannot earn salvation. We cannot earn God's favor, but rather if you do believe, In what I just shared with you, if you do believe in the gospel message, if you do believe that Jesus came and died and rose again, and you put your faith in that, then the fruit of your life will be that you keep his commandments. And that is how we know who has truly come to know him. That is how you know that your conversion is true and it's real and that the grace of God and the Holy Spirit is in you and exuding out of you and empowering you and uh, giving you a passion and a desire to follow him and keep his word. Because many are going to say, I know him, but their lifestyle says something completely different. The fruit of their life is rotten. It stinks. Their mouth is filthy. They hate their brother. They gossip. They slander. They hurt people. They manipulate people. They lie to people. They try to get one up on people. It's a dog-eat-dog world. They're selfish. They're careless. They're full of sin. They're full of living a life that pleases themselves rather than a life aimed and geared towards pleasing God. What they say with their mouth and what the fruit of their life actually shows are two different things. Remember the lesson of the fig tree that Jesus cursed. I've talked about in previous videos before. It's professing to have fruit, but it has no fruit. Hypocrisy. So whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. We are not keeping his commandments to be saved. We keep his commandments because we love him, because that is a fruit. It is a response to what Jesus has done. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected by this. We may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides ought to walk the same way which he walked. Some of you are going to recognize some of this language from the gospel of John chapter 14, specifically looking at verse 15. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Another way we can read this to understand it, because Jesus isn't saying, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Okay. You know, he's not fussing at us, but he's saying the one that keeps my commandments is the one who really loves me. Okay, we can look at verse 21 and see a similar statement. He says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Why does Jesus keep repeating this? I think if he's repeating this over and over, then we ought to pay attention to it, right? And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And then again, in verse 23 and 24, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. We can go on to John chapter 15, which I'll let you read on your own time. It talks about abiding in the fruit. And he again says, you are my friends if you do what I command you in John 15, 14. So what Jesus is describing here is a fruit of the one who truly believes he is who he says he is and that he does what he says he's going to do, and the one that truly has a heart for him and loves him 
Matthew 7, 21 through 23, you know, what we would say is a really scary verse um, where they say, you know, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And he says, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. I did not know you. That knowing, that intimate knowing, he says, I never knew you. You were never mine. And then John 17, 3, the high priestly prayer, it says, this is eternal life. Jesus is praying. He says, and this is eternal life that they would know you. In fact, I'm going to put that on the screen. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is the same word, know. It's that intimate knowing. So in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, he says, I didn't know you. And here he says, this is eternal life that we would know him. It's an abiding, a remaining, a going back and forth. And how do we know if we're actually doing that? How do we know if we're actually of him? How do we know? How do we have that assurance? By this, we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments, that is a fruit of your life. So I'll close with this. What commandments am I talking about? Adam, are you talking about the Levitical law and the Old Testament stuff? Or are you suggesting that? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm talking about the commands given in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 40. He says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So we look at it as like two umbrellas and all the laws flow from there. They all really come back to, are you loving God and are you loving others? And when we look at 1 John 2, 1 through 6, what is he talking about here? Loving God. And then in the next section that we're going to get to, the new commandment, he's talking about how we can love our brother. So if we're loving God and loving others, these are the commandments that Jesus expects us to follow. And that sounds easy and it's easy to remember and it's great. And it's like, oh, I just got to love God and love others. But when you start to find out that anger against your brother or being frustrated with someone or talking illy about someone or uh, whether it's a sin against yourself, like a sexual sin or something in one of those, like I said, the umbrella, you will find that it'll track back to you're either not loving God or not loving your brother. And it gets a little bit more difficult. And then you understand why we need an advocate in Jesus Christ. Because it's all about our heart posture. Are we geared in living a life that is toward pleasing Him and looking towards Him? Are we trying to love God and love others in all that we do? It comes back to what I've stated in a previous video about the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm going through that. If you actually believe, you will actually do. This statement upset and frustrated some people, but look, Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Does God care about obedience? He absolutely cares about obedience, and obedience pleases Him. I shared in my last video about chapter 1 how David had a heart to please the Lord. It wasn't out of obligation. Yes, he walked in the fear of the Lord, as should we, but he wanted to please the Lord in all that he did. And Jesus says in Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? This is the Sermon on the Mount from Luke's perspective. For the one who hears my word and does them will be like a man who builds his house up on the rock. Well, that's 1 John 2, 1 through 6, and I hope this was helpful to you guys. The Lord has just been all over this this morning. I've just been melting in the grace of God and just overwhelmed by what Jesus has done for us, and I hope this blessed your heart the way it did mine. And if you don't know this Jesus I'm talking about, please feel free to reach out to me personally. My email is on our channel page, and you can reach out to me there or Glasshouse TV on Instagram or on our Patreon page. You can reach out to me there. All of those things are free and available to you. I'm not charging money for it, but if you do want to support us on Patreon, you're more than welcome to do that financially. There's other links below. If you want to give a one-time donation to the channel, you can do that. If you like what we're doing here at Glasshouse TV, donations are always welcome, but never required. And everything that we offer here is 100% free. So if you're not 
subscribe to the channel I would absolutely love to have you and it would mean a lot to me and it really does help the channel out and I would ask that you hit that thumbs up button that's the like button and that tells YouTube to send this video out to more people so that they can hear this message but anyway thanks so much for watching today and I will see you in the next one